Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Still from the fishbowl at Oslo. We like it here. Yeah, it's good. Having a good time. Having a good time. It's scotch time right now. Uh, yeah, last show of the day. Yeah. So, you know. It's fun. It's iced tea, sort yes. of. Iced tea from Scotland. In a plastic glass. In a plastic cup. What are you going to do, man? Yeah, what are you going to do? Proper time to Barry Dorans is here. We're going to have a party, right, Barry? Mm. Yes. Even though, you know, it's Scotch and not Irish, but yeah. what, what can you do? What can you, you do? You can't educate Americans. It's <laughs> <laughs> funny. Here, hold my beer. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started with Better Know Framework. Awesome. <laughs> All right, man, what do you got? I got something very cool today. Uh, it's called Webpack. Webpack? Yeah, webpack.js.org. So it's a module bundler mm -hmm. for a modern JavaScript app. So it processes your application and recursively builds a dependency graph that includes every module and then packages all those modules into a small number of bundles, usually only one that's loaded by the browser. So that, you know, it's... It's configurable, and it works. It's a good piece of your toolkit when you're a web developer. No yep. choice about it. And it's free, but they accept donations. And it's a JavaScript Foundation app, and I only know that because I've been working with the JavaScript Foundation yeah. lately with Humanitarian Toolbox. Very so. cool. Yeah, all good stuff, man. Yep, so go check it out. Webpack.js.org. Very exciting. Who's talking to us, man? Grabbed a comment off of show 1287, the show we did back in April 2016 with Kim Carter talking about InfoSec for developers. And we certainly talked about OWASP there as well. A uh, bunch of great comments on this show, actually. And uh, let me grab one of them. Ricardo Shimoda Nakasako. Nice. Great name. Yeah. I believe the best part of the show was the comment. It's the comment on Kim yeah, Carter's yeah, yeah. show right. talking about start SSL and let's encrypt.org. Mm. Two sites that definitely changed my life and local SSL testing at where I work. Yep. Thank you so much for going through all the comments on earlier shows. You're absolutely welcome, Ricardo. And That's what while we this do. comment may be a year old, it's also awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for your comment. And you can't encourage enough people to use stuff like start SSL and let's encrypt. And a .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you. And if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or via any of our social media, because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet. We bundle him and then flush him down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> we bundle them and deploy them to our users. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's bring back Barry Dorans. He's been playing with computers since the days of the dead flesh keyboard on the ZX Spectrum. I have no idea what that is. I know what that geeky. is. It was a terrible keyboard. That's right. what it was. Uh, graduating to .NET via RPG, Quick Basic, C, C++, and VB, his time has been spent in various markets, from banking through telecoms and even parts of the record industry. He specializes in .NET and Microsoft technologies, looking at whatever takes his fancy and running with it to see where it goes, with a passion for sharing knowledge gathered during each of his code expeditions. Barry is now the .NET security PM at Microsoft. Welcome, Barry. Wow, that's a it's it's an old bio. It is, but we you know, we, we updated what, it slightly. That's but, what we got. But yes, I don't run with things so much anymore as carry great big heavy bricks and then <laughs> fall and and <laughs> injure myself security wise. What's it like do, doing security at Microsoft? Do you find you have to sell things a lot? Or I I think the both of you know me well enough to realize that I have absolutely no selling skills whatsoever. <laughs> Mainly because you know because to, you know when I'm talking to customers I'm pretty much brutally honest and sweary. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But which, you're which, which upsets a lot of the salespeople, to be perfectly honest. Well, but I mean by sell, selling the ideas of being secure and selling, hey, really, you really got to do this. And you know, people don't like security, let's face it. So that is a, that's a hard sell. People don't want to do any work to be secure. And right. over the last few years, we've tried to make as many things secure by default as possible. Right. And then, of course, people Complain discover that, that there doesn't are work. yeah there are there are knobs and tweaks, and then they just <laughs> turn security off. Yeah. And at that point, well, you've shot yourself in the yeah. foot. I I can't do anything for you. But yeah. I like that outcome better than the MongoDB debacle where security was off by default, and if you weren't diligent, now they're stripping your whole data store of right. data. 
you know, de- secure by default is a good choice. Thanks yep. for that. Yes, it's sure just is. it's it's a hard one to sell to people sometimes because right. they have to put a little extra thought into why things are secure by default and why what they are wanting to do does not work. Right. Why are you impeding my progress? Why are you making my this thing so hard? That's not just customers. I mean, that's that's David Fowler as well. I don't, obviously. <laughs> I don't need to you think. You just chuck David under the bus. I always chuck David under the oh bus. Oh, my goodness. Did David and I have, have long in-depth discussions where I want to secure things in such a way that they can't be turned off. And then David sits there and goes, no, 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 we shouldn't secure it at all. And then Damien sits in the middle and comes to a nice inflection point between the two of us that will actually be usable for customers. Nice. I'm being a little bit unfair to David, but he deserves it. That's good. And you've only had a couple of sips <laughs> that of scotch is true. so far, so I can't wait for the He'll 45 swearing, minutes from now. Yeah, he's swearing at him. Oh, cursey barrel <laughs> arrived, I suspect, but... That effing guy. Well, one, once you edit, once you edit all the swear words out, it's going to be like a ten-minute podcast. It'll be fine. <laughs> Either that, it will bleep him. It'll just be one long tone. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm happy to have you here. I went back and looked, and like you're on show 325, man. Mm. That was a long time ago when card yep. space was still a thing. Yes, when card space was still a thing. That's right. I kind of miss card space. I liked a lot about it. Yeah, and now you know, with Open ID Connect, we're almost where we were with hard space unfortunately except yeah. except for the nice locked down OS UI which I still think would be a wonderful idea well you said open ID connect so we got to talk about that mm-hmm. let's really why yeah let's 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 start at the start what what is it why do we need it well if we if we start at the start we 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 go back from open ID connect through OAuth and then back to open ID and then card space and WS Fed. So all <laughs> these things have been ways of I'm gonna upset people now because you know OAuth is not really an authentication spec, it's just what everybody used it for. Right. But they were all ways of federating identity or handing your identity concerns off to another party. So right. you yeah. never you never had to store usernames and passwords yourself. I mean, which it's a, is that's a fine goal. Yeah. It's an absolute Nightmare. You've you've seen over the last few years all the username and password databases mm-hmm. get breached and millions, Troy's, and millions, Troy Troy Hunt's really really large have I been pwned <laughs> yeah, database. That's right. Just when you think it couldn't get any bigger, yeah. it gets way it's, bigger. <laughs> so you know you want to hand that off to someone else and then cross your fingers and hope they don't get breached. Right, right. It, yeah, it's not so much that I want to be safer, so much as I want it to be somebody else's fault. Yes, and somebody <laughs> else's somebody else's problem. And so how does Open ID Connect work as opposed? to OAuth, which I think probably a lot of us They have, all have honestly with. work a little bit the same. You you send a... When someone wants to log in, you redirect to a... Authentication uh, to server. A, yeah, to an yeah. authentication server. Of some point, they type in their username and password. The authentication server asks for permissions. Mm-hmm. If you've never done it before, it's like this application or this website sure. wants to know this about you. You hit yes, mm-hmm. and it comes back again with some sort of token, yep. either in a form post or in the URL, and you pull that out and you validate it to make sure it's coming from who you think it's coming from, yep. and then that's the user's identity and off you go. Right. And then that token, uh, it's sort of like a key that allows them to get into certain things and not into others. It's something that you well, can authorize against. No, that, that's where it gets slightly more interesting. The authorization is your concern. Right. Nice. So with Open ID Connect, you are just getting something back that says, this is what this person is. Yeah. It may have some additional claims like a date of birth or your first name and your last name or your email address. But the, the authorization is is an app concern. Yep. Now, Agreed. you see people, especially people that are using AD, hmm. sending back AD group membership and stuff within a token, but really that's not what it's there for. It's just getting an identity, and then your groups, your permissions should be up to your application. Right. So is this sort of an answer to Identity Server? Well, it's what Identity Server uses. Okay. It's, it's one of the myriad of formats okay. Identity Server uses. Identity Server does a great job of supporting every single protocol underneath the sun going yeah. back to WS Fed. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, they are just serving the identity, not permissions. Got it. But 
the identity itself. Now you can sort of abuse it and put claims in and put permissions in claims, but that makes identity people and Dominic very upset. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Although he's finally breaking down, and they're going, they're making a set of tools for authorization as well. After mm -hmm. many years of saying we'll never do that, mm -hmm. like they keep getting asked, they keep getting asked. At some point, you're going, okay. Yeah, just we'll do, we'll, it. we'll do it, and then you and, can all be quiet. And yeah. where does WIF fit into all this? Remember WIF, Windows Identity WIF. Foundation? Was it? Isn't that it, what it was? It was, yes. Yeah. So that was that was part of WCF. That was part of. And that was authorization stuff kind as well. Of, wasn't yeah, it was it? WS Federation. That was probably the first set of federated identities. It's still used by a lot of old school banks and stuff like that because it okay. enables some more interesting scenarios but it's all soap based and right. you know people don't want to use soap anymore they've decided to change their angle brackets for curly brackets they'd rather stay dirty and <laughs> and then you know reinvent the wheel and you see like oh we have now JSON metadata and it's like well that's just wisdom that you're, you're reinventing yeah, yeah. soap why are you doing but that's that's a whole other podcast for someone that will get upset by it okay. um, <laughs> But yeah, WS. you know what we're doing? We're making security entertaining today. <laughs> this is amazing. So WS Fed came first, and that required Windows Identity Framework, and then we merged that into the .NET Framework. Yeah, and then it still belongs to the AD team. So a lot of the of the OpenID Connect stuff mm. is from that team, the team that wrote Windows Identity. Framework so or foundation? One of yeah. yeah. foundation, maybe. It's in the .NET docs now. It's part of four five. Yes, I think it was merged in four, maybe. Yeah, I honestly can't remember. What makes OpenID Connect different or better or stand out from OAuth, let's say, or from any of these other things? What's its so unique we had, characteristic? We had OpenID, mm -hmm. and that was that was lovely, and that was that was secure, but it it required people to do a little bit too much work, especially around figuring out signing keys and stuff like that. Okay. So they decided, all right, we don't want to do that. We'll move to OAuth and drop all the security around signing keys and and things like that. Because signing keys is kind of a pain, right? I mean, it's stuff you got to do, but yes, people didn't do it somebody particularly has well. To do it. And then people decided, actually, no, we're abusing. OAuth and using it for authentication rather than authorization. So right. now we need to sort of move it forward. And people customized the way their OAuth implementations worked. The Google one was different to Facebook's. And so there was a push to standardize again. And lo and behold, we have OpenID Connect, which has a bunch of standards around it, including things like going and getting the signing key mm. from a metadata endpoint. So it can all be done automatically without developers having to plug in validation subroutines mm. that um, they had to do in the old days. And, you know, it's the new hotness. It's like JavaScript frameworks. I'm sure there'll be another one <laughs> along in, well, not the six weeks like JavaScript frameworks, but right. there'll be another iteration of it. So it takes some of the signing off your plate. It takes, it takes a lot of the pain to actually make it secure away from you. Plus okay. it supports other things like logouts and editing profiles and it does bits and pieces so you can use it in IoT devices so it can be done without a device flow or it has the specific device flow where, for example, if you wanted to register Netflix or Hulu on your Xbox or your PlayStation and it's like, go type in this code on a website, yeah. that's all part of OIDC. And this is an open protocol that's it's an open and, and well-documented yeah. protocol that actually has a list of threats oh, in neat. its documentation, which wow. is nice. And there's a standards process, and you can submit your client or your server to the standards process, and it will run a bunch of automated tests and make you very depressed. And then you go away <laughs> and fix your bugs. Okay. And you come back, and eventually you get a little tick box. And you're now part of the certification list. Yes, you're part of the certification I'm looking list, at the certification which, list I, which I really need to do for some of the .NET components. Well, they, they, there's a couple of Microsoft things in the certified set, right? Yes, they, AD. A, a, AD, Azure Active Directory, and ADFS for Server 2016. Mm. Yes. And so I need to do it with our own stuff because right. the goal is that we move some of our authentication flow away from a straightforward form interface to actually use OIDC behind the scenes, which means we and have to have what? an OIDC service, but it means that we can comment things out. So if you don't like our implementation, you can plug in identity server right? without changing any of your code except for one line. But it, it does seem like we've come around now. and Full, full circle. Yes, but in, a, but in sort of a healthy way too. Like 
I, I'm starting to feel like we're doing this at, at HT Box as well. It's like identity server solves a lot of problems. Yep. Four is pretty darn good. And, yep. and Brock and Dom have made our lives pretty good. Yes. I mean, the stuff that we will eventually ship in the box, it won't be 2.0, it'll probably be 2.1, mm -hmm. because we haven't had enough time to security test it properly. So we're like, okay, nope, we're not going to ship that. Right. It will only support a few of the OIDC scenarios, a right. very simple set to support standard logins and third-party clients. But... The stuff that Dominic and Brock do just goes so much further and yeah. allows so much more customization. Well, and, and for us, we're dealing with, in, in some cases, large NGOs where it's like, no, no, we need to use our existing accounts. We want to federate. And right. that's just, that's there. Yes. Yeah. You just had to turn it on, configure it correctly, figure out your SAML, and you're off and going. It's, it's impressively good. Yes. But not trivial. No. Like, you have to understand that you need this enough to take the commitment to make it work. Yeah, sure. we're, try we're trying to head down the trivial route and then... Right. It, uh, and not break us from and, going to the advanced route. And not break us from going to the advanced stuff. It mm -hmm. will just be a matter of commenting out one line and adding another. And it, adding in an identity line and you're good to go. Yes. So the first, the first glass of whiskey on, on <laughs> behalf of, of one of your narrators here has been emptied and is now being refilled. You're you're welcome to a refill as well, my friend. No, I'm I'm absolutely fine. I'm just I'm just sipping slowly and you know <laughs> trying, to, trying to avoid uh, trying to avoid <laughs> swearing, <laughs> which is where this will eventually end up. I have a story too. <laughs> but first, let's break for a commercial identification. Yeah. This episode of .NET Rocks is made possible in part by Windows on the Google Cloud platform. What? Isn't this a .NET show? Yeah, .NET runs on the Google Cloud platform, man. Everything in .NET? You bet. All the .NET core libraries and more, including 200-plus Google.com and cloud services. Hey, John Skeet's behind it. He's a genius. The John Skeet? The Rescue the Princess John Skeet from Stack Overflow? <laughs> yeah, the one and only. You can deploy your ASP.NET Windows apps to Compute Engine or your ASP.NET Core apps to App Engine or Container Engine which is Google's hosted Kubernetes environment, and it runs like, well, Google. But what about Visual Studio integration? Oh, it's there. I'm reading it now. You can use Visual Studio to manage your GCP resources and deploy your existing apps. Yep. You can get stack driver logging, error reporting, and tracing support for .NET and .NET Core. Also, there are PowerShell commandlets for GCP, which run on Windows and Linux. And if you need help, there are a great set of partners to get workloads to GCP, including Capgemini, Nudesic, and Magenic. So go to gcp.netrocks.com and get your free trial today. .NET on Google. Who knew? Hey, we're here at NDC. You're listening to .NET Rocks. We're talking to Barry Dorans. You're going to tell the Ireland story. I, I am. Good. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, no. This is a story about uh, an Irish guy who goes into a pub in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And every day for 20 years, he's been ordering three pints of Guinness at the same time. And he sips one at a time. One, 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 one. Sip, 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 sip. Right? Right. And he does this because it's his brother's, you know, and his brothers, uh, they, all, they can't be with him, so he drinks in their honor because every day they used to drink together, right? So the, everybody knows this. One day they get a new bartender. So he goes in and he says, three pints of Guinness, and he sips. With, the bartender says, you know, they'll last a lot longer if you drink one pint at a time. He says, oh, no, it's me brothers. We can't be together every day, so, you know, this is the way we, we drink. Ah, oh, that's so nice. Then one day he comes in and he says, two pints, please. The bartender says, oh, no. Did something happen to one of your brothers? I'm terribly sorry. He goes, oh, no, nothing like that. I just quit drinking. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I should, you know, take the mic off, throw it on the ground and storm out. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. There you go. All right. So we heard from Brock, actually, in Orlando, mm -hmm. that Microsoft is doing something similar to what Identity Server is doing in yes. Azure. And is that going to be using OIDC? Yes, that will be. If he was referring to Azure AD B2C... I think that's it, yes. ...which is a social authentication. So we have Azure AD, which is very big and is, is sort of there for corporate applications. It doesn't support social logins. It doesn't support log me in with Facebook. It doesn't support log me in with Twitter 
or anything like that. So there is the business to consumer mm. version of AD, uh, which is still backed by whatever Azure AD uses, but it will allow social auth and it's meant for, you know, phone apps for, for websites, again, where you don't want to take care of holding the usernames and passwords yourself. But, right. you know, it's, it's cut down to a simple subset of the protocols. Okay. I couldn't tell you what the subset is. I honestly, <laughs> I honestly can't remember, but that will be the same thing that we're trying to mirror or emulate in ASP.NET Core 2.1. Okay. We're going to implement the same parts of the protocols that Azure B2C are implementing. Gotcha. And then hopefully if you're at the point of, well, I don't want to own my usernames and passwords anymore, you know, my ideal goal is to hit a button and just flow that up to flow everything up to Azure B2C and then you change one line of code and it's handed over to Azure B2C. That's a very Microsoft way to do things. Yes. Yeah. You know, upselling you to, yeah. to something that might eventually pay my salary. Click this button to yes. implement. Yeah. We were an easy fix for you. You know, I think back to the old ASP.NET membership provider, mm -hmm. and there was really no way out of that. Like, it was better than what we had before, but... It if was. you needed to go further, you pretty much had to re-engineer. Yeah. Yes. Or augment the fields that were in there. You'd right. have to write your Or own. wait for ASP.NET identity to come along and then cross your fingers as the EF migration started. Not that you have any pain there. No, I, no, no I scars. Know. I just... That sounded very Barry positive. Dorans is never bitter. This no. much I, I know. I, I, I will be honest. I've never actually seen an EF migration fail. It's just one of those things. I press the button and then cross my fingers, and it <laughs> always scares me. You know, I used to migrate all my, my SQL schemas manually, and then I, I upgraded to using red git sql compare which would do stuff for the schemas and then i would right. run stuff that way and now with ef it's just like magic and magic always right. scares me <laughs> you know the definition of a genius right this is somebody who knows to push the right button at the right time there you go there's only one button on screen for ef migration so, <laughs> <laughs> so you're in so guaranteed even, to be a genius even you can do it that's right even you can do you it you too can be a genius yeah you know, you press the wrong button at the right time, you're an idiot. If you press the wrong button at the wrong time, well, you, you're just certifiable. Yeah. The right button at the right time, you're a genius. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. So what else can we talk about in this world of security that we haven't? We could, we could talk about what we did for ASP.NET Core. Absolutely. And how we diverged from the .NET framework. Let me guess. So they did so much work on performance that you guys came up with something that slows it way down. That's, that's a very dirty role. That's a, right very, that's a very David Fowler <laughs> attitude. Yes, and there he goes, under the bus, under the bus again. <laughs> he, he's, he's not going to be able to make it to NDC Sydney, so I'm actually helping Damien do his intro to .NET Core. With him? Yeah, with Damien. Oh. This, I am standing in for David, which means I need to either make a recording of his laugh or a recording of a hyena because they're, <laughs> you know, they both have very distinctive laughs. So if people miss David, I can, I can play that. I uh, okay. So, <laughs> so we, remind me to ask David Fowler to be on the show and we could throw Barry have, under the bus. Have you never had, you've never had David on the show? Of course we've had David on the show. Well, yeah, he's, he's happy to throw me underneath the bus. It's, I'm sure he it's, will. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he upset me with his... He implemented some security stuff in his talk this morning, and I was sitting in the front row, and he kept looking over and peering down. <laughs> with a big see, grin on his face? Just to see how upset I was getting. <laughs> he was actually looking for an explosion, right? Yeah. A sort of scanner's uh, moment. I'm sitting there with my... Sit, sitting on my hands going, cannot interrupt, cannot bum rush the stage. <laughs> Drag Don't him off. Don't do it. Don't do it. Does it actually benefit the audience if you tackle him mid-stride? That would be hilarious, but on those bouncy floating stages here, it'd be dangerous. Anyway. Okay, you, so and then he slid off the backside and fell <gasps> sixty feet. Yeah. yeah. So .NET Core. <laughs> yes. Let's 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 <laughs> talk a little bit about .NET yeah, Core. Let's let's talk about .NET Core. Watch me drink. There so. we go. Now he goes to the scotch. <laughs> Everything makes sense. One of the nice things about .NET Core is is we were well. All right. The nice things from a security perspective is we were able to make a clean break. Right. And drop an awful lot of things that were insecure. Yeah. Such as? Binary serialization is my favorite example. Mm, okay. Oh. Unfortunately, that is coming back. Because <laughs> everybody and, misses it? Because everybody misses it, and there is a demand for it in 2.0. Or really old hash functions. Where people like, use like, like binary serialization. Like DES and triple DES. 
Why you even put those back in? Because the EMV spec for chip and pin demands triple des. Oh, uh, an actual triple des? You couldn't just lie to it and give it a real encryption? No, it's just part of the spec. <sighs> Were people using binary serialization as a poor man's encryption or something? What's no, no, the binary serialization stuff is more for client apps but it's just coming back as a whole. And unfortunately, uh. people won't allow me. I wanted to have a new attribute that says, just only ever use this for back compatibility and find a better way to do it. Right. But no one would let me write that. Attribute. Is it an attack vector? Binary serialization can be an attack vector because when you deserialize stuff, you're bas it's basically the same as clicking in an unknown executable. Sure. Oh, I suppose you're right, yeah. Yeah. You are loading binary things. It's telling it the CLR what objects it wants you to create, yeah. and Map some of those objects memory. are yep. dangerous. Mm -hmm. Which is why if you are using binary serialization and you are round tripping it to a client, you need to, at a very minimum, sign it with an authenticated signature. Right. In other words, you couldn't have a, a piece of executable code in a JSON file, right? So the JSON file, the JSON file example is interesting. There is an option in JSON.net which you can turn on. It is off by default, but you can turn it on where the JSON.net serialized stuff can specify the type of the object it is supposed to be deserialized into. So you can pretty much do the same attack vector in JSON that you can in binary serialization, except in JSON.NET, it's turned off by default. Okay. And it's clearly marked when you turn it on, this is very dangerous. But of course, you know, everyone reads the documentation. Everybody can click OK. Have you seen it used that way as an attack vector? We have, we have demoed it. To James, <laughs> we we uh, we we pulled James aside at an MVP summit and went, "Hey, watch this!" And we popped <laughs> calc in front of him. That so is it's wild. Like, yeah, and then we refused to give him that line of code to do it because that one wasn't particularly public. Uh. But if you look at some of the recent stuff around binary serialization that's come out of Google's Project Zero, it's very simple to run command line executables or whatever you want through binary serialization if you haven't validated it and haven't checked the signature. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. It's scary. Yeah. I, I should just do a whole 20-minute presentation of why binary serialization is bad and you're bad and you should feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Go flog yourself. Well, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now. Uh, I must be that happy time again. Yeah. It's time to go pick up my prescription for digital Ritalin to treat my Azure ADD. D. <laughs> D. 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 It's actually time to give away a D experience subscription from Developer Express to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, become a UI superhero with Dev Express UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today and leverage your existing knowledge to build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an Office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. Learn more and download your free 30-day trial at devexpress.com slash superhero. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, unbelievably, is Kirk Cameron. Oh, no kidding. Anyway, wasn't Kirk Cameron the guy who's like on Family Ties? One Something, of those shows. one of those what shows, those shows? Yeah. yeah. Open House. Or Open House. I don't know. Maybe My I My dad remember. has two heads. It was one of those. He was a teen actor, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, I think he was. Probably not the same Kirk I'm Cameron. suspecting not. No. Unless he's now a middle-aged software developer who's about to have a, a Actually, Dev Actually, you know, the, uh, you haven't heard from him on TV. It's so entirely it's possible. entirely possible he got into software. Or On the other hand, it's probably a different Kirk Cameron who's really tired for being mistaken for that You're guy. You're probably right now. Now he doesn't want your software anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm just guessing. That's just me. You need to send him a mug now as well, just for confusing him. Because he's we heard that a lot. I think we will. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Kirk. Kirk. When you respond back to us, we're going to feel bad about it. We'll yeah. hook you up. Just make sure you ask us. Well, anyway, Kirk just won the D Experience subscription from Developer Express. It's a big pile of awesome from them, just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .NET Rocks .com, Click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world, and every show we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But you got to sign up to win. Barry, it's your turn. If you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what would you buy? I kind of need a new laptop. I, I thought he was a security guy. It's like a really big spool of aluminum foil oh. for his hat. <laughs> no, I did, I did the security stuff. I got, I got fed up with all the consumer 
Wi-Fi routers. It went yeah. ubiquity. Uh, yeah, of course it went you ubiquity. Went ubiquity. Everyone, to, everyone, everybody to, likes ubiquity. Yeah. Tell me about ubiquity. Uh, it's just a. It is a reasonably priced enterprise class mesh Wi-Fi. That's reasonably oh. priced for us, not reasonably priced for your wife. No, for, okay. Okay. Mesh, oh, for your partner. You set up lots of little Multiple points nodes. all over the place. You exactly. can do. Yes, I mean. My apartment is small, so it's not like it's, I need a mesh. I can use one of their yeah. pro. You're fine with one Wi-Fi points. Yeah, the pro. Yes. The pro is pretty powerful, and you really need to sign up for the cloud product to allow yourself to administer separately or install Java. Or I think they I'll have go with a the little. Cloud. They have a little Raspberry Pi. Do they really? They, they have they have um, a cloud key. So mm. that that was how you did it originally. Was install Java. You have a cloud key that you just plug in, and that then runs all the Java services for you. Right. Or now you can go full cloud, and you don't even need the cloud key. Right. And you can sign up for that. And it, you know, it's it's Troy Hunt recommended. Mm -hmm. His entire ranch, Kangaroo Ranch, is filled with these things. You know, Troy he managed Hunt recommended means he can hack it, but nobody else can. <laughs> well. <laughs> You know, he got to the point of getting the mesh enough because he was complaining that he didn't have Wi-Fi down by his dock where he keeps his jet skis. Yes. And they oh, said, you know how much oh, that that's sucks. a shame. Yeah. They, they sent him a bunch of mesh stuff, and now <laughs> apparently it works. He is sickening, I swear. <laughs> you know, five, five years ago, I was the one that was doing all the .NET security talks, and then, I, you know, he, he does a couple. I give him MVP status, and then he releases a bunch of PDFs that were, you know, just after my book and my book sales dropped off, and now he just does <laughs> everything, and it's very and annoying. And then you turn on the hotel TV, and he's there on the BBC yes. talking about... I'm listening to podcasts. He's there on podcasts. <laughs> Troy Hunt is in my car, and I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> and what do I get out of it? A kangaroo scrotum purse. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I see those. <laughs> A little gift for you, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Could have been a Tim Tam, but no, it's a scrotum purse instead. <laughs> I'd rather whack myself in the head with a boomerang. <laughs> so we should go back to what last right, week. What we, what we, we, we were we talking about Seriously. something. I don't know. Something. Where we would like to apologize for the show in advance. <laughs> well, midway it's a little, through. A little yeah. late for advance. 40 minutes okay. in, I don't think we're in advance. This, is, this is why they haven't had me back for like six or seven years, because <laughs> well, I'm pretty much sure the last always one was goes. like this. So, I'm serious, though. This is the most fun I've ever had talking about security. Well, I always end up under the desk when Troy's talking. It's like, we're right. all going to die. I know. <laughs> right. So let's bring a little fear and, uh, you know, uncertainty and doubt to well, the conversation. Binary serialization wasn't scary enough for <laughs> It's a little well, scary, but yeah. I don't know anybody who does that anymore. So. Well, you did it in web forms without knowing it. Yes. Yeah. Because that's what Vue it was. Sure. Right. That's what, exactly what Vue State was. But who puts calc.exe in Vue State? Well, you never put calc.exe indirectly, but yes. Yeah. And there are, there are still ways to do it. Just format my hard drive.exe. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not as bad as that, but it's, it, it's pretty close. I mean, the, the Google Project Zero people have some nice examples. And I've, I've demoed them before. I'm not doing that talk this time because I gave it here two years ago. Mm -hmm. So a long time ago, we started talking about what you guys are planning to do in .NET Core. Did yes, we finish that conversation? Done. We did not because we haven't covered what really annoyed people or what really broke people or what really confused people was we redid authorization. Okay. Entirely. Again. No. Again. no this, was, this was the one and only time that we did it. So we, we, You'll never we do changed. it again. Well, I'm never going to say never. <laughs> we might tweak it a little, but we're not going to have that big a break that, that okay. we had going from framework to core. Okay. So if you wanted to do custom things in the authorized attribute in .NET Framework, you had to write your own. But you had the principle and you had all those other... Yeah, you had I principle and, yeah. and I identity. And th oh, I those are still there, except they're not all claims principle and claims identities. Yeah. But you had to write a custom authorized attribute. And it was horrible and it was hard to test and lots of people got it wrong. Kay. And it was a massive pain point. Mm -hmm. And Dominic had been on at me forever to look at doing resource-based authorization because he had... Um, written his own functions around that and another custom attribute. So when Core came along, I'm like, all right, this is my chance to break the world, which I don't get to do often <laughs> enough, in my opinion, because, you know, Damien will stop me. So but they actually we, came to you and said, okay, you're going to break everybody's code. What would you do? So we kept it. We, we kept the simple scenarios, which is just put an authorized attribute on your uh, controllers or on your methods, and that still works. Okay. But we changed how you would customize it. So rather than writing a customized attribute now, we have the concept of 
requirements and policies. Okay. And you write all these things in code because, as you know, core is very code-focused. Code-centric, yeah. So you can now express all your uh, authorization rules in code without having to write custom attributes. So you write a requirement, oh. and your requirement could be something like, you must be over 21 to drink this scotch. Okay. <laughs> and then Reasonable. your policy your policy says, you know, you must fulfill the you must be over 21 requirement and the you must have ID to prove it requirements, so multiple okay. requirements. And you can evaluate that the policy handlers, the things that handle each of the requirements in code. And you just write code that does the most esoteric things. You want to run off to a database and check things in the database? By all means, do it. You want to make a web service call, which would be really weird, but sure, okay, I don't care. <laughs> right. Um, so we made it okay. more flexible and people that had written custom attributes mostly liked it. There were a few people that went, yeah, but I have custom parameters in mm. my, my custom attributes and I want to use those. And we're like, well, you put those as parameters in your requirements and that wasn't enough. So in 1.1, we actually allowed you to replace the entire authorized service and do what you want. Okay. Which is nice. So how does that code get connected? Is it a configuration? So it gets connected by putting everything in DI because everything is DI based. So you have your requirements and they don't need to go in DI because they're just parameters. But you put the handlers for the requirements in dependency injection and then you just add policies at the start when you are configuring your authorization. And then instead of authorized attribute and then username equals and a comma separated list, sure. you just do policy equals and the name of the policy. That's fine. So you pass it into the constructor and everything's Yeah, happy you just put it there. on the attribute where you yeah. would just normally have had usernames or roles before. Got it. Well, that seems fairly easy and, and fairly nice. And it I don't think it get... slows everything down at all. Well, it, <laughs> right, the nice thing about writing the policies is you can package them up and you can share them between your applications. They could be in a DLL. And I have an entire lab for this walking you through from beginning to end, hmm. writing your policies and then ending up in the point of like making your UI vary according to policy and the current user and the resource that they're trying to access. And that's on GitHub. All right. And what and would I'm, we bing to get there? You would do uh, github.com slash blowdart. And then I think it's probably the most popular repo up there. Okay. The second one, depressingly, being my implementation of basic authentication for .NET Core. Uh, <laughs> and, I've, and I have grabbed the ASP.NET Core security docs, too, because I think those are pretty well organized. We spent a long time writing those. Now I, I'm glad. Because they and seem very organized. Yes. The, uh, 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 there's been a lot of community work on them, which has been great. Nice. You know, starting with correcting my spelling mistakes and then <laughs> actually expanding on things that I took for granted that people would know. Richard right. and I have been very impressed with the documentation in the last couple you of years. You should look at the data protection documentation, wow. which is what we replaced machine key with. Oh, good. Um, away from that and registry. that was extremely well documented because the guy that wrote it had a 45-page OneNote talking about uh, all his design decisions uh, and all the decisions that he made as he wrote it. And I basically just turned that into the docs and then took all the credit for it because nice. that's what a PM does. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's great. The developer that I have, the, the couple of developers that I have working on the security and the authentication pieces, um, how especially who does most of the work, has no interest in ever appearing on camera on Channel 9 or ever appearing on podcasts. I've tried to encourage him. So it has to be me that does it. And I just get to, be. I get to take all the credit for his work. <laughs> well, it's not going to be David. So, okay. <laughs> Hell no. Until we have him on and we throw Barry under the bus. Well, we allow him to throw <laughs> how Barry. How would that ever him. happen? I can't imagine that happening. That doesn't seem likely just to happen. Just get David on and ask him about security and .NET Core and how he feels about it. Well, Let's right. see where it goes. Okay. And watch how that goes exactly. For folks who have an existing ASP.NET app and are terrified about all the horrible things Troy Hunt's been talking about, breaches and stuff, like where do you get started? Is it still OWASP? It still is. So OWASP is a good starting point. It teaches you the basics. The unfortunate thing about it is a lot of people use it as a checkbox and don't do any further investigation after that outside of the top 10. I mean, right. OWASP has a lot of resources, and they talk about a lot of things that are outside of the top 10, but people well, and, just and don't explore one, it. And number one, and it seems to be unmovable, 
It's bloody SQL injection. Yeah. Just like, use, it's just astonishing. Just use Entity Framework and get over yourself. Really? That's yeah. going to save? That's going to fix everything? Pretty much, yes. I mean, there is a way in Entity Framework to execute raw SQL, and if I see you using it, I will come and break your fingers. <laughs> well, <laughs> All I, right. I will make that promise to you now. But anybody who uses raw SQL should at least use parameters, and... You can you, save yourself a lot of grief by doing that. That that is true, but the thing is, these things are not taught. Yeah. Still, they're not. Th there are very few. There are very few university courses that try and cover these things. There are very few training resources that try and cover these things. I mean, as Plural Site and and Lydia have come online, they are covering them more and more. And Troy does a great bit. But until you until something bad happens, you don't know that you need the training. Are people yeah. actually still teaching how to concatenate SQL parameters together from input? I don't think they're teaching how to do it. It's just that they don't teach the right way to do it. Kills and me. how many years have we been dealing with? Uh, ever since Rob Howard told us about that, you know, he was talking about SQL injection at a conference. And immediately, as soon as he said that he told, and gave a demonstration, about half the room got up and ran out the door. <laughs> that's why I like giving a bunch of security talks. Is <laughs> there, ah, if I if panic. I can get one person that said, "Okay, I've just uh, you know I've I've just sent an email back to work and we're starting to code review this. What should we look for?" Yeah, that that makes me incredibly happy. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's how I know I've been affected. For better or worse, it's like the run out the room is not a trivial thing. No. Looking at the OWASP top ten for twenty ten, number one, SQL, SQL injection. injection. Like, yeah. well, that was 2010. Well, it's... There's it's, some, there's it, some more Guess what it is one. in 2017, my SQL friend. SQL injection. This is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> nothing changes. So, and nothing so, will change while there are still libraries that allow you to write raw SQL against something. Yeah. So let's just define Open Web Application Security Project, right. OWASP. Yes, OWASP.org. So it's a worldwide charitable nonprofit organization that essentially oversees all this stuff, right? Yep. That's their whole... Reason for existence. Oh, yeah, the reason for existence is to stop you making security being mistakes. Stupid. Yeah. The same. That. And it's like it's if not you can get to two. Now, what do you mean two? Is like there, there's a there's top levels, ten, right? There's right? literally one, two, th through ten. Like okay. we're and and one SQL injection for a reason because it's yeah. just you talk about all the data that's been raped. So much right. of it is just straight up SQL injection. So, so basically, you go down through this list and make sure that you're not violating any of these principles. Yes, and that's a good start. Yeah. But, but it's, it's a just start. sort of the mindset of when somebody says, are we secure? It's like, can you get down the OWASP top 10 yeah. and say none of these exploits are going to hit us? Yes. But like I say, it's a start. You get, you get, you get the top 10 done and you're in reasonable ship. And then you head down the more esoteric routes. Yeah. Things get harder from there. But if, in my mind, given that you're not actually a target, right? Yeah. Like given that it's you are just another website out there. You know, I, I use the, the club analogy. Remember, mm. the, you know the club, that thing you put on your steering yeah, wheel? Yeah, right. Does right. it make your car impossible to steal? No. Yeah. If somebody wants your car, they can do it. Right. But if they want a car, yeah. they're not going to bother with the car with the club on it. You They'll make it more difficult. You exactly. raise the price. If you've knocked out the OWASP top 10, if you're pretty confident that you're comfortable in that space, there is a whole bunch of cars easier to take down than you. That's right. And if you have globalization set to support the Russian language, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I only said that because of that. <laughs> you you, you need to refill, my friend. I I really, need refill. It's, yeah. it's China that worries you me ready more for than another, Russia. My friend, no, I'm absolutely fine. Okay, I'm just trying to be topical. You know, <laughs> trying to be a current, right? Very relevant. Trying to be current. It's just, uh, you know, we're yeah. trying to keep up with the times here. No, no, I love Russia. I love the Russian your, people. Your, Don't your president me. says you should be more friendly to Russia. So <laughs> your president. Okay. <laughs> hey, look, just because I live there, I can't vote. So he's most certainly not mine. Well, yeah. he's not Richard's either. I think no, that was no, the point. No, no. Yeah. I'm so jealous of kind of this president. You know, and I was saying. Lately, it's like generally Canadians are fairly smug about our situation, but we're really smug right now. So, well, my daughters love your president, so <sighs> my yeah. prime minister, your prime, prime we're minister. a civilized country, we have a prime, prime yes, minister. the queen is still your head of state, is she not? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sort of. We kind of have a constitution now, yeah, but you have your lieutenant, you have we a do lieutenant, have governor? lieutenant governor, yes, yes. Oh, yes, and over. you still have the queen on your money, mm -hmm. which yeah. is how I know I'm somewhere civilized. Is when I cross the border, the queen is on the money again. That's how the money, everything's going to be fine. It makes me very is happy. Is that where you're going to go? Okay. Pretty soon, Freddie Mercury is going to be on our dollar bill, <laughs> so queen will be on our money as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the nice, the, the nice thing about security is there is a conference that always falls around St. Patrick's Day right. in Vancouver. And so I go up to Cansec West and I avoid the insanity that is St. Patrick's Day in the U.S. Because there's no, there's no St. Patrick's Day insanity in Ireland. Yeah, there is true. now, but they, they, they did that in Dublin to appease the American tourists. I isn't there love a, isn't everything there a, about that. Isn't there a song that Chrissy Moore made famous called I'm So Happy Now That St. Patrick's Day Is Over? <laughs> <laughs> Although last, last time I was up for Kansak West, it fell on St. Patrick's Day, and I did see a couple of people wandering around Vancouver in green with shamrocks on their cheeks, and I was so disappointed in Canada. Yes. Yeah. All right, so what other nutritional content can we stuff into this show before we call it a day? We could talk about how the Microsoft vulnerability process works. The vulnerability process. And why process. it takes us so long to patch things. Does it really take you that long to patch things? Because putting on my IT hat, generally speaking, you guys are ahead of the curve. So usually it's about 90 days. It's always 90 days if it's come from Google Project Zero, because that's the, the amount of time that they give us. Right. Which is a nightmare sometimes. What's um, Google Project Zero? It is a bunch of security researchers that work for Google and just like to look at random things. So, uh, okay. so they find stuff. They find Travis, vulnerabilities. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pronounce his surname wrong and he'll be very angry with me. And please don't look at .NET, Travis. You've promised me you won't. Travis Ormadi is probably their most public employee. So if you've looked at all the, the last pass security stuff that came out um, right. over the last few months, that's because he's been looking at password managers. He's been looking at antivirus as well and just finding exploits in antivirus. And then they tell the manufacturer and they give you 90 days to fix it. And if you haven't fixed it, they... They publish. They publish. Okay. So th well, I mean, they publish even if you have, obviously. Nice. But presumably, but the point that they publish, you fixed it. Like, we're going to publish in 90 days. Yes, that's how I long hope you you're ready. Okay. I'm looking at the latest blog post from the Project Zero group back from May 10th of 2017, talking about an exploit in the Linux kernel via packet sockets. Oh, they, the, wow. they, there are a bunch of them, a few that I know reasonably well, and they just look at all sorts of things. Right. So this is something where somebody can raise their privilege level, basically, by yeah. you know, overriding some memory There's, there's lots of elevation of privilege. Yeah exploits out there. But the, the way it works for us is we'll get an email to secure at Microsoft.com mm -hmm. yeah. and they figure out what product it belongs to. Usually correctly. Every now and again, it's like, hey, no, that isn't us. That's Windows. Leave me alone. And so I get an email that drops in my inbox saying, hey, this person has reported X. And so I go away and try and reproduce it. And that can take a while because I may have to produce a VM using... You know, it's like, oh, we're only reproducing this in Windows 7. I'm like, okay, so now I've got to spin up a Windows 7 VM. Rock and on. 90 days and later, you get it. <laughs> and, and, and install Visual Studio 2012 or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And I have a bunch of VMs for this, which is why my, my, my work desktop, I don't generally work off a laptop. My work desktop has 64 gig and 4 terabytes of SSD because yeah. I just have this nice. stream of VMs. And every now and again, someone will reproduce something on something I don't have a VM for, and it's yeah. a nightmare. So I do the initial reproduction, and then you know, if it works, uh, which is rare, normally I have to go back and ask for more information. Right, but, usually. You know, it's almost inevitable. I'll, I'll, people that, that are generally used to reporting things will give us a good reproduction and will give us sample code, and that makes me very happy because it right. only takes me a day to go, yes, and, that's definitely wrong. And that would be something in favor of Project Zero is like these are a bunch of very skilled guys when it comes to understanding security problems and reporting them. There are lots of skilled people out there. That, a, Lots of individuals, lots of students mm -hmm. that do it. But some people who are reporting security bugs for the first time either do it on GitHub, which makes me sad because I can't give them any bug bounty money if you report it on GitHub and it's public. Right. Um, so if you have found a bug in .NET Core, I can give you money. Right. Please report it to secure at Microsoft.com. And I, I can provide the link to the bug bounty program so you can see the terms and conditions. Are, are people using Visual Studio's bug recording debugger thing now? I've or? never seen that done. Really? Because that's really cool. No, because it's just, all, all I need from them is a piece of sample code. Right. Yeah. So it, do, it doesn't particularly matter. Some people produce videos and stick them up on YouTube and set them to private and send, send that to, to MSRC, which is a little bit weird. I, if you want to do that, that's absolutely great. Just please send me your code as well, because <laughs> otherwise I have to pause right. on every frame and try and work out what you've written. And, and that is good resolution. really frustrating. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And they recorded it at... Yeah. 640 by 480. 640 yeah. by 480, yeah. <laughs> Six, yeah. 
so we get I, I get a repro and eventually when it repros on one machine I'm like right and then we I, I find the person that is responsible for that area of code if they're still working on it or yeah. just a general victim yes and go somebody in the group <laughs> look at this and you're you're responsible for that piece of code now it's up to you and they're yeah. on vacation for 60 days so they get well, 30 days to actually so when <laughs> generally when people are on vacation there is at least one other victim no it sure. has to be at least one other victim sure, but yeah. the unfortunate thing is when i'm on vacation the whole thing sits there for a well, while? Well, no, that's not true. Are there you the are, person there, getting secure at Microsoft.com? There, there are other people that, you know, it, it goes to Elan or it goes to Damien right. or it goes to other people who don't have framework. So you guys are the alias for secure at Microsoft.com? No, that is Microsoft Security Research. That's right. MSRC. And then they, they forward it on to whomever. So they so do make a, an assumption about who would be responsible. Yes. Do you they, ever find yourself on vacation sitting on a beach using your phone and you get a message and you actually have to do some... I find myself on passing. honeymoon. Oh. oh. And one sort of kicked off and then I, I just knew who to forward it to so I forwarded it along with a reminder that I'm on honeymoon he's taking care of this. Right. Yeah. And it didn't come back and to you. And you're still married, huh? Yeah. Well... <laughs> <laughs> she was asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had woken and up. At, says on I had woken up at five. Oh, she knows I did it. I had woken up at five a.m. and you checked your mail. I checked my mail. Checked my work mail, and I'm like, oh crap, oh crap. <laughs> and I looked at the the vulnerability and what it was about, and went him. Yeah, nice. The, the, the Were other you thing right? Is, I was right. Uh, nice. you know, I've, I've had emails when I'm on the ski slopes. I've had emails on the 13th of February nice. saying, please ring in now. Um, I'm like, oh, Valentine's Day is just screwed. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right. So somebody's listening to the show and they're like, okay, you guys are fun. I'm having a good time. I feel good about security. You should. What are the top three things that I can do today that I should do? Top, top three steps that I should take to, to make myself more secure. Okay. The, the first step is update. Okay. Patch everything. For the love of God, update <laughs> everything. You now, mean I can't continue to use my I'm, Windows XP I love my machine. XP. So <laughs> it's it is, so fast. And none of that SP2 stuff, man. I like it is. SP1. <laughs> I don't like USB ports. So yesterday was Patch Tuesday, and we released patches for XP. Did you really? Yes, oh. we did. I thought it was out of support by now. It is out of support, but there is, there is a. I think it was remote, uh, remote code execution, so another... Wanna cry type vector? Don't all oh, the wow. ATMs in the world use Windows XP? I, a lot of ATMs also use OS2 embedded. Oh. Uh, how many right. patches is OS2 embedded getting these days? I absolutely have no idea, <laughs> but OS2 was wonderful when it started. I, I can remember yeah. playing golf in that thing on 20 a, years ago. On a, on a PS2, which to start off with was a PC, yeah. not, yeah. A, yeah. not a, a games console. All right, so number two. So number two is, is well, keep up in your reading. Be aware. Yeah. So you, are you happy going to OWASP.org and seeing what the current that, discussion is? That's a reasonable one. There, there are also discussion lists that you can do. There are subreddits on security. The, yep. the, the NetSec one is interesting. Um, it has an awful lot of esoteric stuff. There's an awful lot of chaff on Reddit. Let's that face is, it. That is true. Awful but, lot the, of but the junk. NetSec, the NetSec subreddit is, is reasonably good at culling that. But the thing is that recommendations change sure. a lot. So it used to be like, oh, if you MD5 hash your password, you're absolutely fine. No one will ever crack that. <laughs> well, wait, was that true in 1990? But that, so that's pay the thing. Attention. So a lot of the, a lot of the password stuff that that's leaked recently is, you know, these things are really old, and I'm sure MD5 at one point was a good idea. 1990. So you have to keep up to date with it. And then the third point is you have to code. So when recommendations change you can implement them without breaking your existing users. Sure. So how do you do that without telling the future? Use interfaces? So the crypto one is actually quite easy. Part of the Microsoft uh, Secure Development Lifecycle, the SDL, has a requirement for crypto agility. And what that does is when we hash something or when we encrypt something, the first byte in there tells us what combination of algorithms that we used. So one might be MD5, two might be SHA-1, three might be SHA-256, four might be SHA-512. Right. And that's easy to pull forward so you have to think that sort of thing so you version stamp everything okay all right was yeah. that three that was three that, that was three, three. yes yeah. yeah. the three good ones my friend maybe we can add four don't be an idiot just be I, awesome it's, it's never a point it so <laughs> all right I, I i may disparage fowler every now and again but he is most certainly not an idiot and i don't think most developers are yeah i think there I are think people have good intent they're trying i to think do the it's right thing. unfair and unhelpful to call people 
idiots. It's like applying the mom test to something. That's unfair and sexist. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it is. Um, it's just that you don't know. And right. you don't know that you don't know. Mm-hmm. And there, you only have a limited time to keep up on what's new and stuff. And generally, that is, oh, good grief, there's yet another JavaScript framework that came out last week. Right. I've already migrated my stuff to the framework that came out three weeks ago. Now I must migrate to this. Yeah. There's only a limited amount of time that people have. Yeah, right. And you, you're just insisting that they, a certain amount of that time, more than zero spend on a little bit of security. A little bit of security. Even if it's just like watching the news and then trying to figure out what went wrong. Sure. All right, one last question. What is your favorite alcoholic beverage? Bushmills. Nice. Good. Bushmills Irish whiskey, which makes me very happy because I finally got a bottle of the Millennium Malt. Wow. That an MVP brought me from New York because he was he asked a bunch of security questions and wanted to do a bunch of stuff, and I managed to convince him that no, it was a bad idea. And he's like, well, what would convince you? And I jokingly said, get me a bottle of Bushmills Millennium Malt. Now and he did. It. Millennium huh. Malt was laid down in 1975 yeah. when I was five. Wow. And you could only buy it by the cask. You had to invest in buying an entire cask and then they would bottle it for you and I had not realized that some of these bottles had actually made it onto the open market and mm-hmm. are in the MVP in question he found a bottle in an off license in New York that was like three blocks from his house and I still told I, him he couldn't do what he wanted to do because it was I can't imagine how much that bottle cost a lot yeah I, yeah. I got I got wife approval nice wow. it's now sitting in a cupboard and I need to think of a good excuse to open it. I may open it when I finish my master's. Uh, mm-hmm. What's your address? I'm coming for dinner. Yes. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> All right. You understand that a cask represents more than 200 bottles. Yeah. Yeah. So an investment in a cask, not a trivial thing. No. It was not. Yeah. No kidding. And it's, it's numbered. And let's see. I have, I have a photograph of it. All right. So I can, I can tell you what the numbers are. And it was out of cask number 18. Wow. It was bottle number 18 out of 239. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Barry, and thank it, you so much. This has been yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm not bringing it to you, though. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. we'll no come sharing. to you. No sharing. No sharing. We'll mean, come to you. No problem. We know oh. where you live. <laughs> so it will, be, it will be not six years before you do yet another podcast with me this time. It's like, he has, he has booze in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dog. And sorry, that was... The dog will keep you away. <laughs> and just to be clear, that was nine years ago. Was it yeah. nine years? Oh, yeah. good yeah, It was 2008, my friend. And you've been, you've been promising it for a long <laughs> time. I'm pretty sure I've been trying to schedule with you for a while, and you're always too busy to talk. No, uh, I think it's, I've said you yes, and call, then you've you never canceled. Write. Yeah, okay, yeah. So that would Let's that be is. honest. Okay. Don't put the blame on me. I'm pretty honest. You know, All right, I'm, Barry. This was great. Thanks. And, uh, thank you, guys. Yeah. Keep in touch, and we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a